um, and I study typography on the web. I'm a little nervous because I've just started writing my dissertation, so it's fun to talk about research that is very fresh, but also very pleased to share this work with you and learn um, from any feedback or insights that you might have at the end of the presentation. Um, as I was just saying, um, Nasparik is one of the many Arabic script styles, and in Pakistan it is the preferred script style that we use to typeset Urdu. I first became interested in the subject because I was working as a web designer for two of Pakistan's uh, biggest universities, and they were publishing really good research on local communities, climate change, urban infrastructure, but inevitably that research was locked in English. So I thought it's pretty straightforward. As a web designer, I would just build them bilingual websites and we'll do in English. And then we would be including all the people that are not literate in English, which is most Pakistanis. And when I actually started working on said website, I realized it's actually quite shockingly difficult because study support on the web is so, uh, so challenging. And so I enrolled at the University of Reading to give myself the time and the, uh, the resources to think productively about this. Um, a quick disclaimer, I, uh, will, this presentation is not entirely technical because I think it's not possible to speak productively about the technicalities of Nasdaq on the web without thinking or without being informed about the lovely eccentricities of reading culture that is part of Urdu and Nasdaq in Pakistan. So a little bit about Urdu uh, and Nasdaq and then maybe some more technicalities. Uh, so as you can see here, Urdu has 61.9 million native speakers and even more speakers that speak it as a second language. Uh, while these speakers are predominantly in Pakistan and India, of course because of diaspora, there are thousands more all over the world. Uh, and most importantly, Urdu is not the most widely spoken language in Pakistan, but it is the language all printed matter is set in. So it is the print language around which culture and identity forms itself in Pakistan. Um, uh, one of the interesting uh, things to remember about Nastariq is that uh, in any of the characters in the script will have a larger range of contextual forms. Here you can see the character Bay in the initial position, but already it's taking a whopping 14 different shapes, which makes it a very graphic um, word image in any instance. Um, in uh, Pakistan, we use an adaptation of the Persian Nastaliq, and we call it Lahori Nastaliq. Um, the, the stress axis is more vertical, the counters and the rounded shapes are more controlled, so the counters are narrower, um, and it's obviously it's a cursive script, so the joints are also much thicker. Again, giving it a very graphic uh, feel as opposed to the more calligraphic Persian Nastaliq style. Uh, this is quite an interesting story, and. Um, Lahori Nastaliq was designed by a calligrapher named uh, Abdul Rashid, and it was just, it was in 1928 in pre-partition India, just when Muslim identity was being formed around ideas of a separate Muslim nation state, and political identity was being formed in opposition to Hindu identity. Um, here you can see a cover of a poetry anthology by Pakistan's uh, national poet, Muhammad Iqbal. He saw the calligrapher design the script, and I think he immediately understood the political power of having a script script style that could be distinctly for that political period of time, which is uh, Muslims advocating for a Muslim nation state. And he uh, declared that he would stop writing poetry if the calligraphers did not publish his poetry in that particular style. And so, yeah, it's a messy history, but now, because of many of that ideological turmoil, Lahori Nastariq is seen not only as a Muslim style of script, but very distinctly a Pakistani one. Um, to the point where, I mean, as typeface designers, as type researchers, we're quite careful when we speak about the distinction between script and language. But in Urdu's case, script and language are entangled with each other. To the point where if an Urdu reader sees any text typeset in Nasr, they'll just assume it's Arabic. They won't even bother reading it, because they can only conceptually imagine Urdu in the Nastaliq style, which you can see is on the right-hand side, and the Nasr um, on the left, very, very different visually. Uh, one, some of the ways in which, again, Urdu and Nastariq are, have a messy relationship. Um, Pakistani readers had social, uh, Urdu readers had social media campaigns for Apple to um, have Nastariq as the default script style. As soon as you choose Urdu in the iOS, like it has to render in Nastariq. It was a big social media campaign, it was successful. So now we have loads of horrible system font Nastariq that we suffer with. Um, also, um, in India, increasingly right-wing fascists see um, Nastariq as some kind of a hostile Muslim element. So you can see Twitter user Ali Munis Nikvi uh, saying, 
saying, clearly the Perso-Arabic script in India is associated with Muslims inviting Islamophobic sentiment. Removing signboards or seeing the script as if it's some terrorist language is becoming a norm here. So in this way, because Urdu has such an ideologically charged relationship with Nastaliq, uh, Urdu readers have very fixed stylistic expectations. Um, famously, Urdu newspapers were handwritten and lithographed as late as 1981, simply because Urdu readers did not feel any Nastaliq typeface adequately represented the stylistic expectations they had for their typography. So loads of scribes would just sit in a room writing newspapers daily, and that was just life. Um, Urdu, um, Nastali continues to dominate all print production in Pakistan. So you can see a very wide range of documents um, typeset in Nastali. The On the far left is an image um, from a road signs in Lahore, a big city in Pakistan, uh, in, typeset in Nastali and a little hard to read when you're driving fast in a car. In the center is a collection of local newspapers. Again, every single one of them is not only typeset in Nastali, but most likely in a single font in a single typeface. And on the extreme right-hand side, you can see there are these like, really common and popular event posters in the city, um, again, all in Nastariq. This is even more challenging when you recognize that the typeface that is most commonly in use in Pakistan, which is the Jamil Nuri Nastaliq made in collaboration with Monotype, uh, does not come with any weights or optical sizes. So this is an image of a very popular Urdu dictionary that is in most common in all households. It's quite difficult because there's no meaningful distinction between the word, the meaning, the different pronunciations, like it's all the same. And yet we persist. Um, I know that I've spoken a little bit about how some of the things are tricky and eccentric, but despite that, um, Urdu or Nastaliq in print can be quite sophisticated. This is uh, an image of a uh, Urdu newspaper, really iconic layout, uh, popular across all newspapers, not just distinct to this one. This is the Daily Jung, one of the biggest newspapers. And as you can see, despite not having weights or styles or um, uh, optical sizes, there's been other interesting strategies used to create hierarchy and move your eye across the page. There's lots of reverse text. There is um, some outline text. There is a lot of ornamentation going around. And also the use of other script styles, as you can see in the green there, uh, to um, mark out some sections. And so I find it quite interesting to think about how some of that sophistication can be translated when we think about having Nastaliq publishing on the web. Uh, one of the other ways is that calligraphic expressions are normalized for Urdu readers. So this is, again, a very standard uh, newspaper headline. You can see that the words are shifting, like the, the arrows indicate where the words have shifted above their baseline. And you can see the words are overlapping, the kerning is quite tight, so any Urdu reader, in order to read this, is not just reading right to left, but also diagonally and also up and down. So it's kind of a complex, but intuitive way that we read this. Um, one of the ways that typeface, uh, type, web typography is quite challenging is that typeface design, uh, digital typeface designs are inadequate. Uh, this is uh, one of the most popular even in web, which is the Jamil Nuri Nastariq. Most of, some of you may already be familiar with it. It has a whopping 25,000 ligatures, more than that actually, I think. Um, and it is still really popular online, even though there are a few other um, digital typefaces that are also available but this is everyone's favorite. One of the ways that it messes things up is that words will often appear broken, specifically transliterated words that have been taken from the English and into the Urdu. They'll appear completely broken up, or they will suddenly appear in a mix of Nastaliq and Naskh, or they will suddenly, a random character in the middle will be an outline, again, making the reading experience quite challenging. Um, the other thing is software support. It's quite messy for Nastaliq. Um, things that work in web, one web browser may not particularly work in the other, which for Urdu web developers makes plat cross-platform consistency quite challenging. Um, when I inspect websites from my own research, I realize that a lot of the strategies that um, web developers see in the English on, on popular English websites are just uncritically used for Urdu websites. This is funny because 
these are not even best practices for the Latin. So having obviously false bold and italics is, distorts letter forms. But in Urdu's case, the situation is even more um, intense because the letters will simply break, making them almost illegible. As you can see, the letter in the blue, the word in the blue, it says Unicode. They've um, obviously italicized it to, for emphasis using the M tags in HTML, and that has resulted in the word simply just breaking up. Um, default CSS line heights that work perfectly well for Latin typography uh, don't work for Urdu because Urdu is a vertically stacked script, so you'll commonly see ascenders clashing into each other. Uh, sometimes the ascenders will simply get cut off, and the, alpha, the character calf is a frequent victim to this situation. Uh, there is no harmonious uh, sort of like a progression of type sizes available for web developers to use. So you have loads of chaotic font sizes that, again, really make the reading experience online very difficult. And I mean, I haven't even yet gone into what happens when you make these websites responsive, like what happens when you go from desktop to mobile. Things get way messier then. A uh, web browser is quite a complex document. Not only are we dealing with headings and body copy, we're also dealing with hovers and tooltips and loads of other kinds of elements that require very specific type settings. Uh, to illustrate this, I've just taken a regular button illustration and I've typeset the word uh, send in Urdu, bhejie, in the naskh, which is on the left-hand side, and the lahori nastalik, which is on the right-hand side. And you can see the naskh is pretty straightforward. It fits in nicely, um, legible, but uh, the nastalik that he um, pops its head up. And one of the easiest ways is, yeah, just make the buttons uh, taller, like it's not a big deal. But it, things get quite tricky when you're trying to typeset bilingual stuff, so in the English and the Urdu. The image below is when you hover on a Google Chrome tab and the name of the website pops up, and the Urdu is so small and just basically illegible. And, and that happens quite commonly, so the challenge is way more complicated than just making everything taller to accommodate the sizes. I, uh, re you know, reading cultures are so slow to form and they are also so slow to change. So I think I find it quite, instead of thinking that, yeah, let's just do away with Nastalik, I think it's quite interesting to imagine a Nastalik typeface that actually works at the level of a system font. So when you hover on things and the tooltip, things like that, that are really tricky in small sizes, I think it'd be quite interesting to see what compromises will be made in the design and what opportunities will present themselves. Um, in my work, I am dealing with the second part, which is a very contextual approach approach to Nastalik web typography and how we can think about how we can use existing technologies, existing typefaces, and come up with strategies that can uh, create beautiful, complex, and most importantly, legible documents online. Um, I heard this, um, Zirak Ahmed, I heard a presentation he gave on his Urdu keyboard, Matan Saz, and he said something that really struck with me. He said, uh, build infrastructure, not provocations. And I think it's because infrastructure materially changes the lives of people that have been disenfranchised by mainstream power networks, and I think about that in my research a lot. So of course I'm writing, but a very important part of my research is also that I'm trying to have a design or an application part. Uh, um, we'll be making an Urdu website that uses some of the interesting and eccentricities, but also the usefulness of Nastalik in print, and then adapting that um, to a web, uh, web browser. Of course, the translation is not a straightforward one-on-one. -on -one. Um, to that end, I want to have something that is really useful, a complete boilerplate, a CSS style sheets that anyone can just pick up and use, and also really open documentation for both how to do bilingual typesetting, because even when the document is completely in Urdu, the numbers are always in English, and that kind of makes kerning quite tricky. Um, so that's something that's really important, and then just a nice cheat sheet so that someone like me doesn't have to enroll in a year-long MA program and can just make websites. Um, and yeah, so that's the intention. Thank you for your time.